We're reading in Book 10, Canto 2. We had just started this canto. The gospel of death and vanity of the ideal. Death has been showing to Savitri the dream twilight of the ideal. But now he wants to tell her that all those dreamy ideals are vain and useless. That is his message, the gospel of death. He proclaims the vanity of the ideal, which is just, according to him, an appearance. So we're on page 608. And we start reading, I think, at line 54. All here emerges born from nothingness. That's the beginning of death's gospel. Is it Praveen sitting up there at the yes, back? Hmm? Yes, I'm Praveen. Will you read, Praveen? All here emerges, born from nothingness. Encircled, it lasts by the emptiness of space, a while upheld by an unknowing force, then crumbles back into its parent knot. Only the mute alone can forever be. In the alone, there is no room for love. In vain to clothe love's perishable mud. Thou hast woven on the immortal's borrowed loom, the ideal's gorgeous and unfading robe. The ideal never yet was real made, imprisoned in form that glory cannot live. Into a body shut, it breathes no more, intangible, remote, forever pure, a sovereign of its brilliant void. Unwillingly it descends to earthly air, to inhabit a wide temple in man's heart. In his heart it shines rejected by his life. Immutable, bodiless, beautiful, grand and dumb. Immobile on its shining throne it sits. Dumb it receives his offering and his prayer. It has no voice to answer to his call. No feet that move, no hands to take his gifts. Aerial statue of the nude idea. Virgin conception of a bodiless God. Its light stirs man, the thinker, to create. An earthly semblance of diviner things. Its huge reflection falls upon man's acts. His institutions are its cenotaphs. He signs his dead conventions with its name. His virtues don the ideal's sky robe and an imbus of the outline of its face. He hides their littleness with the divine name. Thank you. <clears throat> this is a question. <clears throat> that our scientists are debating. <coughs> Where has the universe come from? Hmm? And um, one of the theories is that it has just emerged from nothingness, from emptiness, that it comes from emptiness and it will dissolve back into the void, a word that Sri Aurobindo uses very often in the poem. So that is what <coughs> death is claiming. Everything here, in whichever world, it emerges born from nothingness. If it lasts for a while, it's still encircled 
by the emptiness of space. That's what's all around, is emptiness. Hmm? For some time, our worlds, our universe, seems to come into existence and remains in existence, upheld by a force which is unconscious, unknowing, without purpose or intention. And then it just crumbles back into its parent naught, its nothingness. And in fact, death says that only the mute alone can ever be. That is the only thing which can really exist. That silent, empty nothingness. And he tells Savitri, in that alone, there's no room for love. He says, you are imagining love and this ideal world that I have shown you. But it's all in vain. It's useless. In vain to clothe love's perishable mud. The perishable mud of which Everything material is made. Love also is made out of perishable mud. So what you've been doing, you've woven on the immortal's borrowed loom. You've borrowed from the immortal world a loom. A loom is where we weave cloth or tapestry. No. So he says, you've been weaving the ideal's gorgeous and unfading robe. Like a beautiful tapestry, you've been imagining all these things and uh, presenting them as so beautiful. But the ideal never yet was real made. We can imagine and dream of the ideal, but it was never yet, he says, made real. It's never been manifested in those glorious colors that you imagine it. Imprisoned in form, if your imaginations of the ideal, if they get fixed into a form, that glory cannot live. If it is shut into a body, it can't breathe anymore. Its life is gone. The ideal is intangible. We can't touch it. It's remote. Like that, because it's intangible and beyond our reach, it seems forever pure to us. A sovereign in control of its own brilliant emptiness. <clears throat> Unwillingly, it descends into our earthly air to inhabit a white temple in man's heart. It can come there and uh, respond to human aspirations. It shines, the ideal, an image of the ideal shines in his heart, in our human hearts. But our life rejects that ideal. The ideal is immutable, forever unchanging, bodiless, without any form, 
beautiful, grand, dumb, silent. It sits on a shining throne, immobile, without moving. It receives our human offerings and prayers, but it doesn't give any response. It remains dumb. It has no voice to answer to our human call and aspiration and prayer. The ideal has no feet that move, no hands to take our gifts, our offerings. It's actually made out of thin air, a aerial statue of the nude idea, the pure idea. It's a virgin conception. It has come, it has no parent. And what is conceived is a bodiless God, a God without form. The light of that ideal does stir man, the thinker, to create an earthly semblance of diviner things. Those imaginations inspire us to attempt to reach more beautiful existences, purer, truer existences. And some reflection of that does fall upon the acts of human beings. But our human institutions, the things that we try to create, maybe even succeed in creating, are its cenotaphs. A cenotaph is a memorial to the dead. A, a memorial to the dead. After the wars, then they erect cenotaphs for all. Hmm? The body is not there inside. There are no bodies, nothing. Yeah. It's just a memorial. Yeah. Human beings who have great ideals, who conceive of great ideals, they um, try to live a virtuous life. Hmm? So they, according to the ideal. But he says that ideal is just like a, an outer garment made of sky. It doesn't have any substance. Mm. A nimbus, a nimbus of the outline of its face. A nimbus is a kind of shining cloud. Uh, which uh, perhaps appears sometimes in the sky, we can see it, and it may sh shine, it may be lit up by the sun or by a rainbow. And uh, in uh, art, and a nimbus is often shown around the head of a special being, a special person. So, death is saying, Human beings, they do all this, they have all these imaginations, and he hides, we human beings hide the littleness of all these things, the insignificance of these things, by giving them a divine name. But that's not enough to uh, hide how useless they are, insufficient, that bright pretense is not enough to hide the poverty, the indigence of those things which are of earthly make. They are not divine at all. Yes, I think so. Yes. Yes. 
But he says it's all an imagination. And he's accusing Savitri of doing this. Yeah? That you're, you're just a human being and you're, you've imagined this great love between you and Satyavan. It's all just a fantasy, an imagination. Yeah? So in a way, he's trying to fight for greatness. Sorry? In a way, he's trying to fight for greatness. Yes, yes. And to her as a normal, ordinary, below the ordinary kind of person. Yes, he's, he's saying, he's giving her his message, his gospel. And his gospel is that all your ideals, your ideal love, your ideal courage, all this, it is just an imagination, empty, useless imagination. We don't have to believe him when he says these things, but this is what he's saying. That's what he makes this whole thing so powerful. Is pretty much everything that Dad says is true. It's just true on a certain level, and it yes. just says it's the truth that slays. But you can totally resonate with it. <laughs> yes, I think that's true. That what we hear here from the lips of death are the things that we human beings believe. So that's what he's saying. If we go back to line 89, no, 88. Line 88, yes. Earth only is there and not some heavenly source. If there is anything like a heaven, like a higher diviner world, they are veiled, hidden in their own light. If, in fact, there's a truth eternal that's reigning somewhere unknown. It is burning in a tremendous void of God. Again, he comes back to this, this emptiness. No? It's because he cannot see beyond it. <laughs> but he has a hint of it. <laughs> he says truth shines far from the falsehoods of the world. How can the heavens come down to your unhappy earth? And how can what is eternal, how can that live in drifting time? That's one of the great experiences that we have, no, of how time passes and changes everything. How shall the ideal tread earth's dolorous soil, this earth full of sorrow, where life is only a labor and a hope, a child of matter. This is part of his gospel, is that the everything is born from matter, from mud, and is fed by matter. A fire, it is perhaps the ideal, may burn in our heart and aspirations in a way, but he says it's like a, a fire that's going out, flaming low in nature's great. A great is a place where you can light a fire. A journey's toilsome trudge with death for goal. It's all going nowhere else, only to death. That's the end of all your imaginations. Hmm? So, Shraddhavan, this is a very interesting uh, line 97. No? <coughs> a child of matter and by matter fed. Hmm. It is the materialist point of view. Yes, 
Yes, he, he plays all the parts. Yes. When it suits him, he's a materialist. Yes. yes. So, Tinika, would you like to read next? I think we're at line 101. The avatars have lived and died in vain. Vain was the sage's thought, the prophet's voice. In vain is seen the shining upward way. Earth lies unchanged beneath the circling sun. She loves her fall, and no omnipotence her mortal imperfections can erase. Force on man's crooked ignorance, heaven's straight line, or colonize a world of death with gods. O traveler in the chariot of the sun, High priestess in thy holy fancy shrine, who with a magic ritual in earth house worshipest ideal and eternal love. What is this love thy thought has deified, this sacred legend and immortal myth? It is a conscious yearning of thy flesh, it's a glorious burning of thy nerves. A rose of dream splendor petaling thy mind, a great red rapture and torture of thy heart, a sudden transfiguration of thy days, it passes and the world is as before. A ravishing edge of sweetness and of pain, a thrill in its yearning makes it seem divine. A golden bridge across the roar of the years, a cord tying thee to eternity. And yet how brief and frail, how soon is spent this treasure wasted by the gods on man. This happy closeness as of soul to soul, this honey of the body's companionship, this heightened joy, this ecstasy in the veins, this strange illumination of the sense. If Satyavan had lived, love would have died. But Satyavan is dead, and love shall live a little while in thy sad breast, until his face and body faint on memory's wall, where other bodies, other faces come. Thank you. He's telling us that this is a characteristic of earth. <coughs> there, he says, the avatars have lived and died in vain because this is a world of matter, a child of matter, and by matter fed. And the life in the world is just a journey, a difficult journey, a toilsome trudge. We have to drag our way through life with death for goal. That's where you are going. That's where all you human beings are going. And these people, these divine, apparently divine beings have come, they've lived for a while, They've died because, and their message is forgotten. Hmm? The thought, the wisdom of the wise man, the voice of the prophet, these are all useless, all in vain. In vain is seen the shining upward way. You might get a glimpse of it, but Beneath it, earth lies unchanged beneath the circling sun. Here's our earth. Maybe we get some illumination from the sun. But earth as such loves her fall, this low state. And no omnipotence, no great Power can come and change the mortal imperfection of the earth. 
No power can force on human beings, on man's crooked ignorance. They can't force that to follow the straight line of heaven. These words are reminding me of a, a drawing that the mother has made. Perhaps some of you will remember it too. Um, she wanted to explain to a child the difference between the ordinary human life and the life that leads to the divine. And so she, she started with a, a, I think, a circle here at the bottom, and then she showed this zigzag line. This is the way that human beings go from here to there to there to there to there to there. And it all takes a very long time. Perhaps at the end, they might reach the fulfillment. So that zigzag line, man's crooked ignorance, it's leading us like this. No? And there, there's heaven's straight line. Death says, there's no hope for you. You can't follow that. But uh, perhaps you can. If mother drew it and said, this is the way you can go to a child, she gives him that aim that you can, you don't have to follow this crooked line. Yes. And he says, no uh, power, no great power can colonize a world of death with gods. Not possible. Gods are immortal. You can't uh, bring them down here onto the earth. Shall we go on from there? Um, Mita, would you like to read? When love breaks suddenly into the life, at first, man steps into a world of the sun. In his passion, he feels his heavenly element. But only a fine sunlit patch of earth, the marvelous aspect took of heaven's outburst. The snake is there and the worm in the heart of the rose. A word, a moment's act can slay the god. Precarious is his immortality. He has a thousand ways to suffer and die. Love cannot live by heavenly food alone. Only on sap of earth can it survive. For thy passion was a sensual want refined, a hunger of the body and the heart. Thy want can tire and cease or turn elsewhere. Or love may meet a dire and pitiless end by bitter treason or wrath with cruel wounds, separate or thy unsatisfied will to others depart when first love's joy lives stripped and slain. A dull indifference replaces fire, or an endearing habit imitates love. An outward and uneasy union lasts, or the routine of a life's compromise where once the seed of oneness had been cast into a semblance of spiritual ground by a divine adventure of heavenly powers. Two strive, constant associates without joy, two egos straining in a single leash, two minds divided by their jarring thoughts, two spirits disjoined forever separate. Thus is the ideal falsified in man's world, trivial or somber. Disillusion comes, life's harsh reality stares at the soul. Heaven's hour adjourned flees into bodiless time. Death saves thee from this and saves Satyavan. 
He now is safe, delivered from himself. He travels to silence and felicity. Call him not back to the treacheries of earth and the poor petty life of animal man. In my vast, tranquil spaces, let him sleep in harmony with the mighty hush of death where love lies slumbering on the breast of peace. Yes, thank you. So we can recognize these arguments. Hmm? There's even something quite convincing about them. Anybody would like to ask anything about this passage? speaks about the two, Sradhavati. Two strife. Yes. Two egos, two minds, two spirits. The duality, you know? Yes. So first of all, he says, when love breaks suddenly into the life, at first man steps into a world of the sun. Actually, in uh, the description of uh, Savitri's meeting with Satyavan at the end of... Uh, um, Book 5, Canto 3. There's such a wonderful description Sri Aurobindo has given about what love truly is. So wonderful. And that is what is embodied in the love of Savitri and Satyavan. But uh, this is death's description of how it is. At first, man steps into a world of the sun. Everything is lit up and beautiful and no. all. In his passion, he fears his heavenly element more than human. But it's only a fine sunlit patch of earth that's taken on uh, the likeness of heaven, of heaven's outburst. And on that little patch, the snake is there with its poison and the worm in the heart of the rose to spoil the beautiful flower. And even a small thing can destroy the love of this imaginary God. No? A word, a moment's act can slay the God. His immortality is precarious. It can be easily lost, destroyed. He has Man has, or this God of love, has a thousand ways to suffer and die. Love cannot live by heavenly food alone. Only on sap of earth can it survive. This is what uh, death is saying, no? that it needs the juices of the earth. Because what you call love, your passion, was just a sensual want, refined, a sensual want. A desire or a longing of the senses, a hunger of the body and the heart. So because it's like that, your want, your desire can get tired or cease or it can turn elsewhere to other objects. Mm -hmm. Or it can happen that love may meet a dire and pitiless end by bitter treason. It can be is betrayed. Even a true love given, it can suffer as a very sad and tragic end if it is betrayed by the object. 
wrath, anger with cruel wounds can separate the lovers. Or your will is, your desire, your longing is unsatisfied and it turns elsewhere to look for its satisfaction. Thy unsatisfied will departs to others when first love's joy has been stripped and slain, it's been exhausted and killed. Then this dull indifference replaces the fire, the intensity of love. Or perhaps what more usually happens is that an unendearing habit imitates love. The two are just used to being together, they're fond of each other. The routine, an outward and uneasy union lasts, or the routine of a life's compromise. Perhaps the seed of true oneness had been sown into a semblance, into an appearance of spiritual ground by a divine adventure of heavenly powers. But now, what happens? The two beings struggle, quarrel, constant associates, always together, but without the joy of being together. Two egos straining in a single leash if you've got two dogs that want to go in different directions. Two minds, instead of uh, coming together, they're divided by their jarring thoughts, their thoughts which don't match, which clash. Two spirits disjoined, separated, forever separated. So this, says death, is the way that the ideal gets falsified in the human world. Whether it's in trivial ways or dark ways, one way or another, disillusion comes. We get dissatisfied and disappointed. Life's harsh reality, the way things really are, stares at the soul. Then that heavenly hour flees, runs away into bodiless time. So he's telling her, be happy. Death is saving you from this. I, death, am saving you from this. And I'm saving Satyavan. He's safe now, delivered, set free from himself. Now he can travel to silence and felicity, to happiness, maybe even bliss. So don't call him back. Don't try to get him back now to all these treacheries, these letdowns that earth gives us. Don't call him back to the poor, petty life of animal man. Let him sleep in my vast, tranquil spaces. This is the allure of death. There I will be at peace, no? in harmony with the mighty hush of death, where love lies slumbering on the breast of peace. Why do you want to call him back from that? Most of the times if the thing is death is relief, great relief. Is what? Most of the times people think that death is a great relief, no? Yeah, well, life can be very, uh, very, very difficult and painful and 
full of grief and suffering. It is like that. So shall we go back to the top of page 612? This is what he tells her next. Ushi, would you read? And thou go back alone to thy world. Chastise thy heart with knowledge unhood to see. Thy nature rised into clear living heights. The heavens bird view from unimagined peaks. For when thou givest thy spirit to a dream, soon hurt necessity with smite thee awake. Purest delight began and it must end. Thou too shalt know thy heart no anchor swinging, thy gradled soul moored in eternal seas, vain and the cycles of thy brilliant mind. Renounce, forgetting joy and hope and tears, thy passionate nature in the bosom profound, of a happy nothingness and wordless claim, calm, delivered into my mysterious rest. One, with my fathomless nihil all forget, forget thy fruitless spirit's waste of force, forget thy very cycle of thy birth, forget the joy and the struggle and the pain. The vague spiritual quest this first began, when worlds broke forth like clusters of fire flowers and great burning thoughts voyage through the sky of mind, and time its aeons crawled in all across the vasts, and soul emerged into mortality. Mm, thank you. It's a very interesting passage, I think. Mm? He tells her, you have to go back alone to your frail world, which is not solid and reliable. Mm? You have to chastise, that actually means to punish, but it can mean to... Um, purify. Hmm? Purify. purify. To purify, yes. And take off your mask. <laughs> and what's making you blind? See. See how your nature can be raised up into clear living heights and you can gain the heaven birds view from unimagined peaks. You can go up so high and see something so clearly and so beautiful. The heaven birds view from unimagined peaks. That's what I'm offering you, he says. Because if you give your spirit to a dream Soon, hard necessity will give you a big blow to wake you up. Hmm? Even the purest delight has a beginning, and so it must have an end. The next lines are so beautiful, I have difficulty in reading them. Thou too shalt know thy heart no anchor swinging, thy cradled soul moored in eternal seas. Vain are the cycles of thy brilliant mind. Renounce Forgetting joy and hope and tears, thy passionate nature in the bosom profound of a happy nothingness and wordless calm, delivered into my mysterious rest. One with my fathomless nihil all forget. Forget thy fruitless spirit's waste of force. Forget the weary circle of thy birth. Forget the joy and the struggle and the pain. The vague spiritual quest 
which first began when worlds broke forth like clusters of fire flowers and great burning thoughts voyaged through the sky of mind and time and its eons crawled across the vast and souls emerged into mortality. And yes, he suggests that uh, she can rise to a higher nature, no? Thy nature raised into clear living heights. Then you'll be able to see things as they really are, as the heaven bird sees them from those unimagined peaks of consciousness. Don't give your uh, spirit to a dream. Don't fall into delusion. Soon, if you do, soon hard necessity will give you a blow and wake you up. Purest delight began and it must end. But then he says something so tempting. <laughs> Thou too shalt know thy heart no anchor swinging, not attached to anything. You will experience that your soul is like in a baby in a cradle, moored. It is connected. It's connected to the eternal seas. Mm. Beautiful. <laughs> That is why uh, we say that the soul is uh, the gateway mm. because yes. it's uh, the spark of the one itself. Yes. Yeah. Moored with the one. Yes. Permanently moored. Anchored. Yeah. Moored means moored. Moored means. Yes, moored. Um, if uh, if you have a sailing boat, then uh, you will look for a a harbor where you can tie up your little boat overnight or for a few days, you no? Know? That's mooring. But if you are on the high seas, you may not have anywhere where you can moor up your boat. So he's giving a picture like that, that you will be out in the eternal seas and then you'll really be moored then you'll really be connected. Hmm? Your soul will be cradled and protected. What's keeping you away from all that is your brilliant mind and your desires and all that. So he's tempting her very cleverly. <coughs> So let's see how she and, uh, answers him. Uh, Rani, you like to read? <coughs> that is uh, line 200. But Savitri replied to the dark power, A dangerous music now thou find'st, O death, melting thy speech into harmonious pain and flutest alluringly to tired hopes, thy falsehoods mingled with sad strains of truth. But I forbid thy voice to slay my soul. My love is not a hunger of the heart. My love is not a craving of the flesh. It came to me from God, to God returns. Even in all that life and man have marred, a whisper of divinity still is heard. 
A breath is felt from the eternal spheres, allowed by heaven and wonderful to man. A sweet fire rhythm of passion chants to love. There is a hope in its wild, infinite cry. It rings with callings from forgotten heights. And when its strains are hushed to high-winged souls in their empyrium, its burning breath survives beyond the rapturous core of suns that flame forever pure in skies unseen, a voice of the eternal ecstasy. One day I shall behold my great sweet world Put off the dire disguises of the gods. Unveil from terror and disrobe from sin. Appeased, we shall draw near our mother's face. We shall cast our candid souls upon her lap. Then shall we clasp the ecstasy we chase. Then shall we shudder with the long-sought God then shall we find heaven's unexpected strain. Not only is there hope for Godhead's pure, the violent and darkened deities leap down from the one breast in rage to find what the white gods had missed. They too are safe. A mother's eyes are on them and her arms stretched out in love desire her rebel sons. One who came, love and lover and beloved, eternal, built himself a wondrous field and wove the measures of a marvelous dance. There in its circles and its magic turns, attracted he arrives, repelled he flees, in the wild, devious promptings of his mind, he tastes the honey of tears and puts off joy repenting and has laughter and has wrath. And both are broken music of the soul which seeks out reconciled its heavenly rhyme. Ever he comes to us across the years bearing a new sweet face that is the old. His bliss laughs to us, or it calls concealed like a far-heard, unseen, entrancing flute from moonlit branches in the throbbing woods, tempting our angry search and passionate pain. Disguised the lover seeks and draws our souls he named himself for me, Guru Satyavan, for we were man and woman from the first, the twin souls born from one undying fire. Did he not dawn on me in other stars? How has he through the thickets of the world pursued me like a lion in the night? and come upon me suddenly in the ways and seize me with his glorious golden leap. Unsatisfied, he yearned for me through time, sometimes with wrath and sometimes with sweet peace, desiring me since first the world began. He rose like a wild wave out of the floods and dragged me helpless into seas of bliss. Out of my curtain past, his arms arrive. They have touched me like the soft, persuading wind. They have plucked me like a glad and trembling flower and clasped me happily, burned in ruthless flame. I too have found him charmed in lovely forms and run delighted to his distant voice and pressed to him past many dreadful bars. If there is yet a happier, greater God, 
let him first wear the face of Satyavan and let his soul be one with him I love. So let him seek me that I may desire. For only one heart beats within my breast and one God sits there throned. Advance, O death, beyond the phantom beauty of this world, for of its citizens I am not one. I cherish God the fire, not God the dream. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's because of lines like this and insights like this that this uh, uh, book 10, all through its cantos, but maybe especially this one, is so very special. And this is surely why the mother chose this book, um, book 10, to translate. And uh, when she was doing it, she said, I'm not translating it for anybody. It's not for publication or anything like this. But I feel this is the, the only work of Sri Aurobindo's left that can really teach me something. Mm -hmm. So that it would give her a new knowledge. And that new knowledge is being so generously shared with us also such a profound knowledge. Particularly striking for me is this uh, passage about the violent and darkened deities. They too have leaped down from the one breast, from the breast of the mother. Hmm? Uh, 230. Line 230. The violent and darkened deities leaped down from the one breast. There's only one breast, the breast of the Supreme Divine Mother. Hmm? And they leaped down from the one breast in rage to find what the white gods had missed, the pure gods. Hmm? They too are safe, these violent and darkened deities. A mother's eyes are on them and her arms stretched out in love desire her rebel son. What is this uh, uh, they can find which the pure uh, <coughs> deities cannot find? Yes. Uh, Sat Prem fortunately asked Mother, what have the white gods missed? <coughs> and she said, the joy of conversion.
Thanks to Shobindo.